Good evening, everyone. I think it's on with the green. It's interesting up there, it's on when it's red. It's, we're, we're very confused. Um, anyways, good evening and welcome to our joint dinner uh, with the City Council and the Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee. Uh, I'm Lisa Gilmore, Mayor. It's a pleasure to have all of you here this evening to join us for our conversation about everything uh, bicycle pedestrian in Santa Clara. So um, we're going to go around uh, the table here, and if you'd please, everyone, introduce themselves. And when you speak, for any reason whatsoever, just grab one of these and make sure it's green so the folks at home can hear you. So I'm, let's start to the right here. Teresa O'Neill, council member. Hi. Karen Hardy, haven't seen you guys for at least 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> Had a meeting this morning, huh? Uh, Patricia Mahan, city council. Manuel Pineda, assistant city manager. Brian Doyle, City Attorney. Tondo. Tom Grambo, the committee member. Rafael Rios, member. Ken Kratz, a BPAC member. I got this one. Uh, Diane Harrison, member. Craig Larson, two term member, and also uh, Mr. March on the city calendar, if you'll <laughs> notice. It's true, you are. We'll take your autograph after this session, if that's okay. <laughs> Oh, we'll bring our calendars in. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Dennis Singh, traffic engineer. Um, Mike Liu, assistant director of public works. Craig Mobeck, director of public works. Raj Chan, city council. Kathy Watanabe, city council. Debbie Davis, city council, and Bruce's neighbor. <laughs> Well, I want to tell you, you must be a very special co committee because I haven't seen so many staff people here at a, one of our joint dinners oh. as this. So they're all here for you to answer questions or to help. Um, do you have a chair of your committee? I yeah, just, she's sitting right, right there. there. Oh, Karen. Karen. I, oh, I thought on, on this side. <laughs> okay, so we, we have had for so many years uh, Councilmember O'Neill, who has chaired the, the BPAC, and now we have Councilmember Hardy. Uh, who is chairing the BPAC, but I wanted to find out, um, are there things you want to talk about uh, tonight? And I, if I can start with you, Karen, if you'd like to get started. And, and believe me, everybody just, you can just jump in. We don't want to make this very formal. We want to make it very casual and really have a conversation um, because we don't have a lot of time. So Councilmember Hardy, Karen. The reality is, we covered everything from walking, riding, scooters, uh, parking, repaving El Camino, <laughs> uh, bike paths, you name it. And these guys are great at details. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, Teresa, did you have something to say? No, not at this point. We'll oh. Listen to them. Really? Okay, yeah, we're here to listen to you. So if you'd like to just, uh, Diane looks like she's sure. ready to go. If you want to get us started. I forgot to turn it off. But um, yeah, this is Diane Harrison. Um, and um, I bet Karen's kind of sorry she took this committee at this point <laughs> after one meeting. No, with us. she's not. No. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, my uh, number one issue is um, because it's very, Im very, very imminent, is on the, re on the repaving of El Camino. I strongly want to see, once, once they remove the street parking, which they're going to have to do to repave, that they leave it off permanently and stripe some class two bike lanes. Um, I don't see, it, it, it really shouldn't wait until the El Camino Real specific plan is done. It, that could, it, you know, however long it takes to do the plan, it could take even years more before it's actually implemented. And uh, we have a, a climate action plan, as I'm sure all of you know, um, we have to reduce our greenhouse gases, and getting people doing their shopping on the El Camino by bicycle would be a big step toward doing that. Um, and then it's also in our bike plan. We, want, we would like to see bike lanes on El Camino because it's it's, there's it's a lot of safety issues on that street as far as accidents. So I think that that is another good reason to do that. 
even if we can't do the fancy protected bike lanes, at least get something down so we're not dealing with parked cars, buses, and the whole bit. Um, the street parking that's there is almost 100% not needed because most, almost all the businesses have an ample lot. There's a few that have a small lot, and they can work out agreements with the, with the business next door if they need to. Um, it, it's, it's doable. And there are side streets as well, but I think mostly the, I see a lot of lots that are not fully used, so working out an agreement with your neighbor would make sense. Um, but we, when we are on the El Camino, generally we're going to a business. So we are, you know, important to the city in that way. I mean, I shop, I don't know, I think I've sent you an email. I counted how many stores that I shop on, on, on the El Camino. Quite a few. Um, and uh, as Betsy, who is not able to be here, says, um, we should do the low-hanging fruit projects immediately. And this is one of those because the striping's happening. I mean, the paving's happening, the striping's happening. We may as well just stick some extra paint down there and, and put in those bike lanes. It just makes sense. Um, many people feel unsafe cycling next to paved and moving cars. And, and when you think about priorities, which is more important, a parent and child or a parked car? So, I don't know. My priorities, it seems like the people are more important than the parked cars. So... I, I strongly urge you to do whatever you can in your authority to, because we've been asking for it for a long time. It's not like a new request to, to get them to do that, when the, the state to do that when they repave El Camino. Can Thanks. I ask, that because your comments have led to a couple questions for staff. One is the repaving of the El Camino. Um, can you give us an idea of where the, the, the state is on that because we get, we have more complaints about that than probably many things. Um, uh, and it's pretty bad. So that, and then the second thing is, um, uh, Diane brought up the taking the parking off the El Camino. And I know, I thought we were studying that in the El Camino specific plan. So where we are, because I know we've had your input, we like to get everyone's input on, especially the businesses and others that have the El Camino, so we have a full picture of whether or not we, you know, take the parking off the El Camino, but where are we on that? So those are the two questions, the repaving El, El Camino and taking parking off the El Camino in the specific plan. So for the benefit of the bicycle um, and our pedestrian committee, um, the, there are three council members that live within 500 feet of the El Camino specific plan and the El Camino. And uh, based upon the, the strict wording of the political, of the political reform act, um, they're not supposed to participate in the making of any decision with regard to property within 500 feet of property that they own. I thought we were re-looking at that because it's a Yeah, well, we issue. haven't been able to find any different answer. And in fact, that section has been expanded to include 1,000 feet for certain types of decisions. So we're, we're, we're trying to deal with the issue of the conflict of interest and, and, and El Camino, but we have not come to a conclusion. I think that you know, it may require that we, we send a letter to the FPPC and ask them and get the... Even on the repaving of the, which we're not doing. Well, repaving is fine. I, not I, making any decisions on that. No, you're not making a decision on the repaving. But the issue would be, if you were to change the parking or change a, a, put a bike path while you're doing the repaving, it's probably something you should not participate in at this point. I mean, it's I guess it's okay for you to hear that, but in terms of deliberating <laughs> with the rest of the council about what to do with that ask. I think it's probably better not to do that at this point. Okay. Uh, be, before uh, Craig does, provides an update on the repaving project, I just wanted to kind of go back to that because as part of the El Camino Rail presentation that CDD completed, there was discussion regarding the parking and parking removal. And we had specific direction we were moving forward with because there were a uh, number of locations that were identified that didn't have alternative parking opportunities. So we were moving forward with kind of what the game plan would be and we would come, we would come back with more details. And that's kind of the, uh, 
it wasn't it was in direction as it was a study session, but that's the general discussion that we had. In addition to that, um, the council also asked us to explore lane reductions, and we're going to come back to council as to what that would mean from a cost perspective and also a timing perspective. So there's quite a few things that came out of that study session related to on-street parking, removal, and even the possibility of a lane reduction analysis was added as part of the study session where we have to come back with more information. I have a question. Um, what is our jurisdiction and what is our, you know, our range of influence to, to tell the state what to do on the El Camino? Well, I, you know, regarding El Camino, it's, uh, we, we can't tell them what to do, but certainly you can request for them to explore ideas and as part of that process. Uh, so unlike one of our cities, which is ultimately, and we, as part of the study session, we had this discussion as well that all the concepts we've shown for El Camino we're really ultimately up to Caltrans approval, but we can present concepts, have those discussions, and see what, what they're, kind of where, where the openings would be. Uh, but we do have those, uh, the, the parking issue we had, an outcome of kind of how we're going to come back to the council, and then we also have to come back with the analysis of what it would take if the council did want to study a lane reduction, which came up from two council members at the study session. So to, uh, to piggyback a little bit, uh, when Diane brought up about pay, you know, for the green for the bicycles, who would pay for that? Is that Caltrain or is that us or how? Like, what would that cost and what does that look like? Or is that part of the specific plan? Yeah. So the the paving project. Maybe, I'll, maybe you can give an update. No, on the, the striping, on the, the, the bicycle the, lane. The, itself, so so the, the painting. The paving project does not have a bicycle lane as part of it, but a bicycle lane could be added in the future. Um, where the curb lane would be once we have um, an approach related to those locations where the businesses don't have other parking opportunities that we mentioned to the council, we have to work through what the options might be. Yeah, so in regards to an update uh, for the paving plan, we uh, attended a pre-construction meeting with Caltrans um, recently, and their plan is still to get started in mid-April. So that's what they're continuing to convey to us. Uh, they have their contract on board, so they're gearing up. Yeah, one of the big frustrations we have on this committee is missed opportunities. You will have a street being paved, which is the best time to reconfigure and put in bike lanes or do whatever else you want to do. But it, the timing just never works out or you don't want, the, the idea of putting the bike lane in there isn't brought up soon enough or, or yeah, you're not completely in complete control of the timing like with the state. And it's, really frustrating to see these missed opportunities go by because once the payment's down and done, it's going to be years before it's done again. And the opportunity of doing it along with the repayment is by far the cheapest way of doing it rather than doing it separately. So that's one of the biggest frustrations we have is we miss opportunities mm -hmm. that uh, are possible. Yeah, I, I, I would add that... Uh, and I, Diane's seen these. There's there's bike lanes on the El Camino Real in is it Sunnyvale? And I, I, my guess question to the staff would be: uh, I thought the cities control what kind of parking or what happens along the curb. I I know the sidewalks. If you go along the El Camino Real, some cities don't have sidewalks. So the sidewalk along the El Camino Real is the cities, is my understanding, and. Uh, I'm thinking through association that the parking along it would be something that the city would be involved with uh, for sure and that Caltrans would probably go along with anything that we would, we as a city would uh, request. So yeah, they're only interested in probably the lane configuration that they can move the, the three lanes of traffic and the parking's kind of incidental. So I, maybe you could speak to that. Uh, is there anything that's really holding this up that uh, I even came up with an idea for very little cost, we could put some uh, barricades out there and put some no parking signs uh, along the street to see if it works and see what kind of complaints and issues come up. You could put the signs on the poles that are up there now or you could put them on barricades. Anything you could say along that? Yeah, we're not comfortable really discussing this level of detail about this project. This is not specifically on the, on the, the agenda for, for this meeting for the, for the city council. This was supposed to be a general discussion with, with um, the Bicycle and Pedestrian Committee. So I, 
Like well, that, my, 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 my misgiving about it is the fact that we have three council members that should not, be part, not even be in the, the room discussing a project within 500 feet of property they own. And so I, I, I think it's okay to have or generally heard this, but I'm, I'm more and more uncomfortable about placing them in a position where someone could accuse them of, of um, a conflict of interest. Or the alternative would be those three, if, if we want to continue the, the discussion in this level of detail, that we would um, ask them to leave until, until we're finished. We, you know, I guess, <coughs> who is it? It's me, uh, Karen, and Raj. And I know it's the El Camino Real is important. So would, should we step aside until you have an El Camino discussion and then we can that, come back? I know it might be important to the committee. Yeah. I'm, I'm okay with, with stepping aside. I just don't want to place you in, the, in a yeah, position that's of fine. having I, a problem. I'm okay, too. Yeah. Okay. Let's just step out and call us when we can come back. It please. will only be a couple of minutes. Okay. We can get some We'd like to come back. I just want to hear the official yes, reasons. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, by the way, I'm a little surprised because I remember when we discussed this at, at this came up, topic came up in front of the full council. I don't remember these members ago. leaving no. the room. Maybe you could address and, that. And this, has been issue, this has been an issue for years and years and years. Two right. of the council members were not on the council a year ago, and I don't remember whether Mayor Gilmore was there or not. In, in the last study session, the three, the three of them did not participate. At the last study session. Wait, are you guys turning on your mics because you're really hard <clears> to hear? So yeah. maybe we can, yeah, yeah you can okay. focus our, our discussion yeah. more on, on your questions per se, because my question really is, what authority does the city have? Personally, frankly, I think anyone who parks on the El Camino takes their life in their hands. I would never do it, but <laughs> it's me. Um, so if we were to remove the parking and make room for a bike lane, appropri appropriately uh, you know, marked bike lane, which would be safe, yeah. uh, and eliminate the parked cars, what authority do... I guess my question is, can, can we do it unilaterally? Do we need state's permission? And can we force the state to accept what we want to do? And maybe you don't have the answers to those questions right now, but maybe we can find out the answers to those questions. Yeah, and I think they are important. With, yeah, with regard to the park, I think the, the first thing that's important, and obviously I don't know the full history of, of this question, but to my knowledge, the city has never embarked on any studies to remove parking along El Camino. And so I think the first thing that's going to be accomplished um, potentially under the El Camino specific plan is to look at parking removal and specifically to engage the business holders um, all along the El Camino to get their input, to get the public input as you, to move forward and, and provide input to the council when making a decision on is there a need to move forward with uh, okay, parking removal. But that removal. sort of still begs the question because even if we engage everybody and have studies, yeah. what can we actually force the state to accept from what we want to envision on the El Camino? So I, I think once getting that support from the community. Some businesses have issues with parking, but say you were to make a decision, yes, we want to go forward with removing parking. I think then we can coordinate with Caltrans on the removal of parking. They might not have an interest uh, with that. But don't, um, we, don't you think we should get those answers first before we embark on a lot of if, studies? If, that well, may what I, yeah, what if, I if I may, just because I have worked, I did work on the Sunnyvale project and have worked on other projects in El Camino. So Caltrans, typically you have to go for approval for Caltrans, and typically you wanna, um, when it comes to parking, they don't usually have a concern associated with that. They're more concerned about the travel lanes, the pockets, what's happening at the signals, and parking is usually not a significant issue of concern for them in general. You never know if they're gonna have an issue with it. I think specifically to this location, after the, the last study session that we had and as we discussed uh, in the presentation and staff report, that they, we, I think staff would, was recommending removing parking along the corridor and doing the appropriate outreach for that except for two or three locations where the businesses in front of those, in those areas did not have adequate parking on site to meet their customer requirements. And one of the things we said we would do is we would do additional outreach with those businesses and see how we could, um, if we're removing parking everywhere else, how that would all work together. So that's where we left it at from a staff recommendation was to look at parking removal two or three locations where there are concerns and issues because the businesses have concerns and issues. Obviously, if the council would like to, uh, in the future, give a direction to remove it, even if, you know, if the, the business's concerns are, you know, secondary, we could, you know, we could look at that. And then we would follow up with Caltrans for that parking removal. In my experience, 
uh, like I said, we, you can't force Caltrans, but it's a parking removal is a request that they don't have as much interest in as say if you, you wanted to remove a travel lane, which is the other thing we have to come back to the council with. But that's where we left it at. Staff recommendation to ultimately remove parking al along most of the corridor, do more outreach associated with that, with three or four locations where the businesses needed the parking for their customers without alternative parking. Uh, Diane, go ahead. Yeah, um, I appreciate the fact that you worked on the Sunnyvale one, so you kind of know, you know, some of the ins and outs of that. But, um, you know, you're new and, and some of the, uh, well, the, the new council members are gone, but um, we brought it up at last year's uh, council dinner. Um, we commented about the fact that it is in Sunnyvale, and that was not the first time. We have been asking for this. Maybe no, the city has not done anything, but we've been asking the city for this for some time. Now it's a month away. This is not the time for studies. This is not the time for a whole lot of negotiation. This is the time to make a decision that this is what we're going to do. We have to eliminate the parking anyway to get the, the, con the uh, asphalt down. So at that point, you just say, you just don't put the signs back that say you can park or whatever it is. And you just have, have pay whatever additional amount it costs for Caltrans to, to paint that bike lane. Yeah, is there? And, 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 then, and that's it. I mean, and, and then when we do the El Camino Real specific plan, however year, months and years of, it, of in the future that is, then we can worry about protected bike lanes and removing traffic lanes and all that kind of stuff. But this is something that can be done immediately, needs to be done immediately, um, for the sake of the climate, for the sake of the people of the city, for the sake of just about everybody, but a very, very few customers who park in front of the businesses with very small lots. And they can be, those lots can be shared. It's not that difficult with the business next door. Every time I, I go there, like I said, there are lots with plenty of empty spaces. So they could easily do that. Yeah, I would add that we, it should be accelerated. I, I don't agree with the attorney's idea to try to reduce lane sizes. That's going to get Caltrans in a tizzy. You'll, you'll spend years trying to work on that. There's no reason why we couldn't ask Caltrans, you know, do you have any issues with getting the parking off? We don't even need to stripe it. We can put some signs, no parking signs, down the length of El Camino Real. You'll save even more money, and we'll have the space for cyclists. El Camino Real is our most uh, collision uh, numbers for cyclists in the city. It is 10 times greater than all the rest that are in the high collision ratings. So we need to focus on that. We have, an, we have a collision once a month, and it continues to this day. So that's from the bike plan studies. So uh, there's no reason why we couldn't even put the sign. We have a sign shop to save money there, too. They can make those signs, and we have a crew. We can put them up. Now, the main stumbling block is what I'm glad you filled us in is get Caltrans or uh, the, the, the state to say, yeah, we don't have any issue with, with the parking uh, being removed. And that seems like a pretty fast thing that we can do, fast track it. If you throw in a bunch of other require or other things that we might be looking into, like lane things, they will say, we'll have to get back to you in a year. So I know how these things work. The more things you add on, the more controversy there is. This is a simple thing for our city. Sunnyvale's got it. We ought to have it too. Let's let's uh, protect our cyclists that we do have. This is a high priority item. Just, for... just just want to clarify that for the public that it was not the city attorney. It was, it was me who uh, mentioned the yeah. the. the proposal to uh, have a lane Apologies. removal. And once again, I think that uh, we have two council members who requested uh, for us to what it would take to look at a lane removal in El Camino, and we're putting a cost and scope of work and analysis separate from the parking question to let the council know if they want to pursue the lane removal, kind of what that would mean. And I think that should be coming back to council in the next couple months. We've been working with a consultant to determine that. Bruce? Thank you. Uh, we're also a pedestrian committee, and since we're talking about El Camino, we have all the experts here. Uh, Ms. O'Neill remembers probably that years ago, I mentioned the fact that after you did the lighting down El Camino with the decorative lighting and baskets, that uh, for some reason the intersection lighting and the, specifically the crosswalk lighting was never upgraded and designed to um, the standards that uh, I, I guess are in the, in the plan. So 
I, I, I'd like to, that my first question is, uh, is there a plan or in who's going to be doing what to change the poles, change the arms, change the luminaires so that the crosswalks are, are lit? There are some crosswalks that have zero lighting according to my light meter. And uh, So the, the lighting at the signals, and, and Dennis can chime in here, is Caltrans uh, responsibility. On, and so those were not done by the city of Santa Clara. That's correct. Yeah, I talked to the city staff uh, members uh, who were involved with the the, the lighting um, down uh, the, the walkways and areas, and uh, they all said that, uh, yeah, it, it, it's not appropriate. The El Camino plan is there to uh, promote a safe nighttime as well as daytime walking. So is there an initiative uh, on part of the city to hit Caltrans with this idea that uh, the lighting at the signals needs to be conformed to the LEDs and to a safe level. I don't believe currently they have projects to upgrade that lighting right now or any of those signals. Well, I'm um, saying no, the city have an initiative to get a hold of Caltrans. Uh, we can certainly ask them about it, but it, certainly we would not be taking over responsibility of maintenance or modifying the, that lighting. Uh, but we can ask them if they have a plan to do it. To my knowledge, they yeah. currently yeah. don't have a plan on replacing signals in that corridor. Yeah, I think you know, <coughs> when you're dealing with agencies like Caltran, you need to keep asking them. You know, just going up once may not be by, by any means enough. They've got a lot of things on their mind, and you've really got to push for what you want them to do. And in this case, I think it's a big safety issue, and it's really worth the city just keep at them until you, you know, get them to say either yes, we will, or no, we won't, and then decide what to do if they won't. Teresa? Yeah. Oh, okay, I wanted to ask a question of our, um, of our Director of Public Works. So, uh, Craig, I know that Silicon Valley Power provides most of the street lighting, and I know that some of my discussion with Mr. Donahue in the past has been about when we did the because I had talked to some of the staff like in community development and things. When we do the El Camino specific plan, whether we would be looking at, you know, architecture, the lighting, you know, a number of things on the plan. So um, since I think Silicon Valley Power does, you know, they paid for all those beautiful decorative light posts and the, all the LED lighting, and that's because that was part of their original mission in 1896. Um, would the city have the option to supplement the lighting? I didn't realize that, that Caltrans was actually doing the lighting of the intersection. Would, you know, could we supplement? Because I know the complaint is in some of those areas Sorry. that we don't have enough <coughs> lower lighting, particularly for people who are walking, the, to illuminate the sidewalks in that area. So, I mean, so uh, could, could we see if Silicon Valley Power could do some augmentation since they had done all the rest of the lighting? Are you referring to pedestrian lighting along the entire corridor or with Well, particularly the, there's some spots that are bad, like particularly so near the, the intersections intersection, are not good. Yeah, so in, in regards to the intersections, to my knowledge, the city did not take any um, steps forward to contact Caltrans to say we want to replace these, we want to take over maintenance. Certainly, I think Caltrans, anytime any other jurisdiction is okay. requesting to take over items, take over oh, maintenance, yeah. they, they will yeah. certainly they, They'd be, like us to do the whole yeah, thing that, all the time. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they're looking for cities to take over all their freeway maintenance as well. Yeah. Um, so certainly, like I said, we can talk with them in terms of engaging SVP to, to do some projects out there for city to take over any maintenance. Obviously, that would be a different <laughs> discussion, but we can reach out to them and discuss that with them. If I could follow up, uh, my, my, my suggestion is, as Ms. O'Neill has expertly pointed out, that there are lights on the traffic signals, and th there are lights that are across the street because it's a wide street that are the decorative lights that the city put in. And the installation of those decorative lights, uh, they should be substituted for long-armed um, type of light under the city jurisdiction so that the other half of the crosswalk is, is lit. So it, if you picture a, a, a typical intersection, maybe there are two arms across El Camino that are state facilities that you've indicated to me, but there are also two arms and lights on the other side of that crosswalk that are decorative lights that do not show any light far enough from the curb to be uh, illuminating a safe crosswalk. 
And so my, my request, and I don't know how the committee and all this were just talking, maybe we need to get a resolution, would be that the city uh, contact Kyle Trans, and then secondly, that there be just an in-house um, review of what feasibility there is to extending the areas that the city actually has the improper light at a crosswalk. So if I, these are very important issues and questions, and this meeting is not the type where we're going to take any action. So if, when is your next meeting? It will be PAC meeting. June. Not till June. Yeah. Well, if if, have, I, we if we I have a special okay, one I was going to suggest that some of these should come as recommendations from your committee to the council. So if you have a recommendation specifically on the, you know, bike lane, taking it out, you know, if you can put it on your agenda, maybe have a special meeting before June uh, to get these recommendations to the council so we can take action, because we clearly can't take action here tonight on both these issues, on the pedestrian lighting and on the bike lane and no parking. <coughs> All I'm hearing so tonight, here. Can I just can I just make a statement because um, you know I am the attorney for the city and I ha have to be concerned about liability that the city might incur, and statements like improper lighting or unsafe, um, you know that can carry meaning. Especially this is an open. I I, I don't want the f I don't want to inhibit you from expressing your concerns about safety and I because you are concerned with safety, but by the same token. Um, I, I just want to make it clear in the record that, you know, expressing your opinions about what you would think would be more safe than the, than the current condition does not necessarily mean from a legal standpoint it's an unsafe condition. Um, and, and I always, even when the council members like to discuss these issues, I always caution them to be very careful about their language about declaring any particular area of the city or condition in the city to be unsafe or um, dangerous. So. Well, um, your, your, your comment is well noted. I, I do have a background and certification in lighting. I, I, I understand can, all that. Say, uh, if we can take a step back, we're getting too far into too much detail here for this type of meeting, Diane. No. Yeah, I'd like to say that, and I'm sorry about your comment there, but all I've been hearing tonight is we can't, we won't, it's too, no, we don't Diane, have enough that's time, not what I said. Um, and so forth. And it is our safety, our safety is being told, we are being told that our, the safety of bicyclists, the safety of pedestrians really doesn't matter that very much. I think that's what anybody Because we have been asking, room, for, it's been okay. on the bike, it's up been on the bike agenda for many times. I it's have been not mentioned seen it here any many times. From it is definitely a matter for our agenda. We all want to see bike lanes on the El Camino and we all want to see it when it's being repaved this next month. And this month. needs to be brought up at a council meeting where we can take action. Yeah. I'm sorry, and and one last comment on the El Camino, if I might, uh, to the director. I noticed that the if the paving project is starting, they're grinding something, but you have uh, two-inch curbs in the medians for the area near uh, Lawrence Expressway for quite a distance. Is the city or is the Caltrans going to replace those as a, as, a, as a requirement of their contract? You're, you're not going to bring the asphalt over so that you can drive straight into the median? So I don't know on that specific circumstance how Caltrans is dealing with it. Um, I don't believe they're replacing medians under the project, so they'll be doing a variety of conforms and paving. But in your specific instance, I haven't seen that area of the plan to comment on it. Yeah, I, I've tried to, con I spent oh, four or five hours trying to get through Caltrans to talk to the project engineer, and I couldn't find his name, number, or anything, and I talked to the representative from Caltrans at, our, at the meetings. Anyway, thank you. Okay. Thank you. So are we finished talking about the El Camino as far as we can go at this meeting? All right, we can call back the mayor and council members, Chahal and Hardy. What? Just, just a quick, oh, quick yes. word. Uh, maybe what we could just do is when we repave, Paving is going to be a big benefit for bicycle safety as well because the pavement is in really bad shape, so we look forward to that. If we can just put down a stripe, get them to put down a stripe. Well, that's for, and, but, but then later the signage of saying bike route or no parking is a later issue that doesn't have to be addressed in the next before the pavement occurs. Well, I'm going to ask them that we refer this to staff to bring back to council if, uh, in some fashion sooner than later because I think... Those two, you know, narrow issues only deserve some council attention and action. Thank you. Just, just to get, oh. <laughs> just, oh, just, just to get the, 
<laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I just wanted to get some clarification on bringing which item back to council. The issue of no parking in bike lane and the issue of pedestrian intersection lighting. So the, the no parking and the bike lane is getting addressed under the El Camino specific plan through the well, study. I think we're asking to have it brought back sooner for a council level discussion to, to get the answers to the questions that are brought up here tonight and to see what we can do before that plan because it's, it would be, as Diane points out, a, a long time. I'm afraid to speak, yes. so are yeah. we okay? Uh, is it all right? Can we speak now? I, I have a new yeah. topic. <laughs> okay. uh, <clears throat> something that came up at last uh, meeting uh, last night, and uh, we prepared something to give you an idea, <clears throat> is the Freedom Bridge across from the, uh, uh, or the provides access. Yeah, uh, Diane has a, a, a suggested letter that the city uh, staff is going to prepare, but she went ahead and prepared a uh, priority uh, preliminary rough draft of, of a letter that we would like you to rubber stamp. Basically, yeah, the, the Freedom Bridge is, is a bridge that uh, provides access from the Intel area uh, east of the Santa Mas Aquino Creek. Uh, of course, you all know that that's where there, our great trail uh, runs, our bicycle and, uh, path and pedestrian path. Uh, and there are other large businesses on the east side of the creek that that bridge serves, such as Intel. And it needs to be saved from removal by the water district. It's an old bridge. It has a legacy in the city. And it's heavily used during the day, uh, especially during lunch hour. I was out there just a week or so ago, and it, I, I couldn't ride my bike. There were so many pedestrians, especially uh, uh, on the bridge as well as on the path. So it's heavily used. It's one of our uh, main features in the city. And the alternative, if they take the bridge out, is a long, circuitous walk to access the trail. And let you know, the trail does have a public access, or the uh, bridge has a public access point on the east side of the creek. As you know, the path runs on the west side. So there is public access from great... Mission, I'm sorry, thank you. Mission College Boulevard, there's some bollards. You can go past them, get on the levee, and walk down to the Freedom Bridge and access the Santa Mosquina Creek Trail that way. But that's a long, circuitous route to all these businesses that are located on the east side of the creek. So I'm asking, and I brought this up, it was one of my issue uh, for quite a while. We need to find out from the water district what steps are needed to upgrade that bridge rather than remove it and replace it with a much more costly bridge that would take years and inconvenience a lot of people. Uh, I appreciate whatever, uh, we're basically asking the city council to ask the water district to see what we can do to save that bridge. And, uh, so, you know, uh, I'm thinking, you know, I don't know where the money's going to come from. Maybe can I ask before you go on, because may maybe many don't know where this Freedom Bridge is. Okay, I can but, tell you. But um, I'm wondering, who, and who put in the bridge, and doesn't it go on Intel's property? Yeah, I, Isn't it I on can fill you in property? a little bit of that, because the staff so, filled us in. Yeah, the bridge is located south of Mission College Boulevard. And it's only, I'd say, a couple hundred feet, may or maybe 300 feet from it. And it's a, it's a pedestrian bridge. It's uh, steel uh, girders uh, with a wood framework on top that provides the walkway with handrails. That's all wood. Uh, so I, I looked at it myself. I, I used to work here at the city as a public works inspector. I haven't done a thorough inspection of it, but it looks like the steel looks pretty good. Who put it in? Who put uh, that bridge in? It was in? put in during the construction of the Intel buildings. Evidently. So Intel put it in. Does Intel maintain it? it well, that, I... Uh, yeah, that's my understanding that they we'll give do. Give a license agreement, agreement from the water district. Yeah. Um, can I make one quick interruption? I, um, I just I want to get the background of this I'd like bridge. for council if you, if and um, and and BPAC members. So if you're a staff member, and there's some BPAC members who didn't get one. So if maybe some of you could, okay, whatever. It's just I'm just saying that some people didn't get. Yeah. One. Um, Brian, did you have something to say on this? I just want to oh. make sure we. Um, in analyzing the, the bridges over San Tomas Aquino Creek further up, 
by specifically by the stadium. The way that works is um, the, the water district doesn't own the bridge. The water district provided an easement to the two two property owners on either side. Are they both private property on either side? I, yeah, I think so. I mean, I don't know yeah. do, if, if you yeah, know the so answer. Th yeah, I the think Teresa knows. History of that uh, specific bridge. So Intel is currently on one side of the bridge. They used to own the property on the other side. During construction of their facility, they were able to permit through the water district that bridge as a temporary construction bridge. It was supposed to be removed when construction was completed. As time went along, I think that bridge, uh, the district lost track of it. Um, as they've been going through their studies and looking at different bridges in the corridor, in the, in the river corridors to create capacity there, they discovered there is this bridge there that was still standing and needed to be removed. So that was the process recently over the past few years where they reached out to Intel about, hey, here's the agreement. This bridge was temporary. You need to remove it. Teresa, so. you had something. I know you have a well, lot of Well, I was just going to say, so, yeah, yeah so um, uh, Intel sold the property on the, on the west side of the creek to you know, it's the p potential Graystar development, which we're kind of in a, and I know the Graystar was interested in preserving that bridge uh, to enhance their development, you know, and, and now it's, it's the debate whether Graystar is going to be part of that Freedom Circle specific plan area. So that was some of it was like, what are we going to do? I've had a couple of meetings with with uh, board member uh, with uh, Barbara Keegan, who represents uh, most of Santa Clara, and quite a number of um, the water district staff has showed up a couple of times. I was like, "Whoa!" Um, so they they are very they're getting. They, I think they do feel like that they've kind of lost control of their waterways, and so they are um, the opinions that they had or that they've expressed to me was that they really want these bridges out. They don't want them upgraded. I'm just telling you, I, you know, I know folks don't want to hear. I mean, this is what their position was and that they had granted a license agreement to Intel in the kind of, you know, in the type of a uh, type of easement really, but a license agreement. And I think there was some, there was a fee being paid by Intel. And uh, there was also an issue about at first Intel was like, okay, take it out. And, and all of that, and then they they realized that a number of their employees were using it because to come up, it's in between Mission College Boulevard and 101 mm -hmm. on the creek, on, and, you know. And so, getting there's some people feel a little nervous about the way the the roadways are and the pa the path and everything's when it gets to Mission College Boulevard, how it's and Agnew Road, how it's and we've had some discussion in the past on BPAC that perhaps that wasn't the safest, so people preferred coming across the bridge. Um, and, I mean, Intel was originally interested in possibly doing something like granting an easement because people, even if they're not Intel employees, they're coming across on that bridge and they're going down through the Intel parking lot, which some there was a lot of discussion at, like, staff level, whether it was appropriate. That was not really a good idea to be having all these people coming onto private property. Um, so the challenge is, is that, you know, the last couple of times I've talked to the water district, I mean, they were pretty assertive about like, I, you know, and they're like, I thought you'd be done with all this. And I said, well, you know how bureaucracy takes. And we said, we're working on a Master Creek Trail plan. We're working on the bike ped plan. We're working on specific plans. And their comments to me was like, well, we thought you'd be done with all that by now. What does that mean, we'd be done with all that? <laughs> like, like the, we the, would build, yeah, we the would city have, would build a new bridge? Like, well, right, what does you that know, mean? But, but, you know, that's what I thought. Well, huh. so even if we have a new bike plan, a new creek trail plan, and all these specific plans done, just, it doesn't mean that, you know, we're, we're probably still, we, you know, most of the, a lot of the employees and other people would still want that bridge. So, what are Intel's thoughts on this bridge since they, it's on their own per, their own private property? They want down. Well, they they were kind of flexible either way. I mean, they were having to pay money every every six months to the water district in order to allow them to keep that bridge. One of the issues that came up, I think, when they became aware of it, and Craig will know much more about this than I would, that uh, maybe Dennis remembers that if the bridge is removed, there has to be some restoration of the creek, the banks of the creek and some other. So I think in some ways 
they thought, oops, this is going to cost us more money if the bridge has to be removed and everything has to be restored. And Craig or um, no. anyone, do you have any info from Intel on how their feelings on this? I don't have any uh, info from Intel. Excuse me. Um, they, I know to this day they haven't granted any easements through their property to facilitate people, public, going through their, um, their area. In terms of Intel, uh, that bridge, there was a few issues with the water district. One, it didn't meet the height requirements for uh, the, the necessary 100-year flood, so that was an issue. And then there was questions about the ADA um, issues as well. So the discussions with the water district with Intel was the bridge, for the most part, would have to be removed or a major project would need to be um, uh, underway to meet the necessary requirements. Because it was a temporary construction bridge, there was questions about its construction, how it was installed, and, and those sort of things. Um, but to my knowledge, uh, the district issued a letter to Intel giving them a, a deadline to have the bridge removed. And I don't believe to this point Intel had responded back that they were willing to take over the bridge, do the necessary repairs. The mitigation uh, that Councilmember O'Neill uh, mentioned, that is correct. Anytime you get in that waterway, <coughs> it's waters of the state, you get into permitting, mitigation, off-site mitigation, there's a number of issues that come up that would also have to be dealt with with the removal, as well as if anything was uh, was constructed or altered in there. Um, <clears throat> I, <clears throat> I crossed that bridge for the first time today on my way here from work. And um, the bridge does not go on to Intel property. The bridge crosses completely within the creek zone. There is a bridge, there is our steps down from the levee onto Intel property. That's probably not ADA compliant. But on the far, on the Intel side of the property, the levee is, is gravel on the top and continues on to Mission College. So there does, there is public access to the far end of the bridge to Mission College and on the, that side of the levee. Um, I also had to take a different right uh, route here today because there was an event at the stadium, and so <laughs> yes, that closed a big uh, my uh, that closed that route. And so, taking a different way, I took I went across the Calabasas Creek, and there was a bridge very similar to that same bridge near Mission College, and it doesn't have any more clearance than the bridge at Intel. And in fact, Mission College has less clearance than the bridge does it intel so i really question the clearance issue yeah in addition on the clearance issue if, if uh, that bridge has a problem the, the overcrossing on 101 is even would have a tremendous problem because it's even less distance between the height of the creek to bridge yeah there's a there's a number of bridges that don't meet that requirement but this going back to this one is a temporary construction bridge and the district was going through looking at all their facilities that's why this item came up, and they noted that it was temporary. It was supposed to be removed, and that's the course that they're heading towards uh, right now. Well, maybe we can get some information back from the Water District and Intel, more importantly, as to where they are with this. Um, and so with this letter, we're asking to – hold on. I can't speed read this, but um, – it's a draft, okay. So we'll take a look at this draft. Does our staff the, have this draft? It's to summarize. It's asking for the technical structural report, the, the freeboard analysis for the creek, and the ADA uh, compliance uh, so that whoever wrote the letter from the district end would be able to have the backup information and allow the city to consider if we should, again, approach them on uh, the bridge. Okay. So... The notion is that when I when look nosed around, no one seems to know anything about the bridge. And so you believe there is this backup information well, available I, I, I you, hope, based on their conclusions and their reports? Well, I hope a senior person with a water district wouldn't just make up things to say, let's get rid of it, that they, they are, they're, they're duty-bound to. Yeah, it, hope not. <laughs> it, it seems that okay. you know, we haven't been provided, the staff hasn't provided any technical support. I wasn't really expecting it. The water district has that, I suppose, and we, we don't have it. So okay. we're looking for a solution for that that, w that maybe we can facilitate as a city yeah, and, and working with a joint program with, okay. you know, with Intel. You know, if there was a major problem with it, with Intel and the access, you'd think they would have fenced it on their private property down at the base of the levee if there was a real issue there. And they ha that bridge has been there 
long time. Yeah, it's been there. Mayor, Mayor if I may, just, I mean, we're, yes. we're happy, happy to go back and talk to the Water District. I just want to let the council know that um, we have met with the Water District before. The city manager's office has met with the Water District before. We met with one of their chief operating officers as well as one of their electeds, uh, encouraging them to uh, reconsider this item. But ultimately, they have told us uh, that this is a bridge between them and Intel, and we agree the city has no part of it, but we're happy to go back. I just wanted to let the council know that no, the just, city has the... been proactive in trying to encourage them to find a solution between them, but the water district has held steadfast that they, uh, the, the issues that Craig mentioned, that it's important to remove this uh, bridge that was intended to be temporary, but, we but we're the... happy to go back if the council you would like can, us to. can, because we do see the usage of that bridge. I, I have another question if, uh, if I'm in turn to, to ask, and it has to do with uh, philosophy that uh, I unfortunately uh, is ingrained in me, and so if I am overspeak, please shut me up. As I tell Miss O'Neill, I shouldn't speak uh, ill of things. But, but the notion is to the city attorney and to the, and to the council, there, there is a, a development in a project within the city, and I won't specify what, that um, is not following the guidelines for safety that have been established by various committees, the state, and interested parties outside the city. And so the, the staff has gone ahead, and I, I don't say anything ill of them, they have their judgments. I just happen to have a peculiar, uh, more zealous uh, judgment. So the, the staff has gone and reduced adopted standard that is published and nationwide and looked at through AASHTO, the biking idea. And, and, and so this is a, a fully vetted uh, standard over the years. The city is violating that standard and uh, I think it's dangerous. It's dangerous because it's too narrow and doesn't follow the standard. It's well below it by 30%. And it, um, it is a notion that uh, is, creates a hazard because it's a curving street and the width of the vehicle lane uh, is uh, being reduced to 10 feet, which is an, just a, it seems like a number, but there is an 11 foot standard. And, but more importantly, we, we have uh, reviewed the proposed master bike plan 2019 and the consultants within that have adopted uh, the notion that if th there should be a, an extra lane for bicycle protection and one of the vehicle traveled lanes should be eliminated. That's their formal recommendation in their formalized report. And they cite all the outside agencies that have adopted the standard. So we have on one hand the need for the city to put this bike lane in and the engineering department saying, let's put it in and um, we'll get this done, and it's a half a million dollar job. And then the idea being that it kind of violates the safety hazards, in my personal view, uh, of, of many organizations that are above the city and have more expertise. And I'd like to say that I, I think it's a council issue, but I'd like to hear the city attorney's judgment on the city willfully violating adopted standards. I'm not sure that the city attorney can answer that at this point, not knowing the specifics of what it is, but... Yeah, I have no factual basis to make any kind of judgment, nor do I have any legal research in front of me. I mean, you, you made a bunch of statements, and I don't even know where you're talking about. So, I, you know, I, so, I just think it's... I just don't think it's fair to put me on the spot like that. I'd be more than happy to have you give me information, and, and I can receive that and, and see if I need to advise our cl my client. I, would, I don't advise members of the public, I would advise my client. But, uh, you know, if you want to send me the information you have, I could, in a, in a sober and considered way. Um, well, I didn't necessarily uh, want to come take up it to an that answer. level. I just like a more philosophic answer. Well, I... I well, philosophically, we don't philosophically, like to break I like, the law I like here in the city <laughs> council. <laughs> so I don't... Well, yeah, it, it, it's, not, I, it's we, not a law. It's I, an adopted standard. Listen, so I, yeah. thank you. I... I we don't know, I don't know what project you're talking about, what street you're talking, I don't know any of the, our council, we don't know any of the specifics of that. Certainly we're interested, so if you could please give the information to our city attorney or city staff um, so that we can follow through. 
you know, we'd appreciate that. Well, the, so, commi the committee did the discuss at length, and they have the information. Okay. We don't, so I, you know, it's hard for us to, to answer anything like that, but we appreciate you giving uh, it to of our course. staff. I understand. All right, but thank you. Um, we're going to have to close up because we have a council meeting that starts at 6 o'clock. We'll have to break this down. Yeah. I wish we did. So would you like, is there any other closing statements you'd like to make? Yes, please. I'd like to make a quick one. Um, mm -hmm. It has to do with the undercrossing of the Creek Trail by the stadium. Uh, on the uh, planning sheet for uh, grant activity, it shows that uh, in the future, I believe to, we'll apply for grants to offend that. But we, do we know yet if the undercrossing there is done, will that allow the trail to be open during stadium events? Have we gotten a definitive answer from somebody like the stadium authority or public safety or whoever because it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to go forward if it's not going to solve the problem that we intended to solve. And so, that is the problem. Uh, just to, to highlight that a little mm -hmm. bit, uh, having passed there today, they close it half a mile away. I mean, you add an underpass there, it's not going to make a difference. We are working diligently in our stadium <laughs> authority executive director and our stadium authority attorneys are working um, diligently to get that stadium, um, <coughs> to get the Creek Trail open during stadium events. Yeah, Brian, I, I, do you have I, I, to say? I think the specific question is to ask them, if we do this specific project, will that allow the trail to be open and get a definite answer from them? And I, I, I commit to you that I will find out that answer. I mean, I, I, I enthusiastically support your, your sentiments on the, on the trail being reopened. That's one of our strong goals this yeah. year is to get that reopened. I am passing out, and I know many of your council members have already seen it, but for Raj and Karen's uh, benefit, uh, this is a plan that I drafted. Yes, we it's have an that. idea for yeah. relocating the trail in that location to keep it open all the time. And I don't see a problem. It's an elevated structure catching the trail down by, uh, Ag uh, is that Agnew? Whatever. Uh, and goes... Yeah, Tasman and goes up to Tasman. So uh, that that would cost money, but that's something that maybe we can figure out uh, at some point and, and uh, get the money for that. Uh, I, I have a quick okay. thing about the... Uh, uh, we see. have about three minutes. Okay. Three minutes, uh, like five minutes right. ago. <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the bicycle plan, well... Uh, it, it, we, we, we are doing a 2019 bicycle plan. The last one that was done is 2009. Even the plan, the, the authors of the, of the uh, 2019 plan uh, mention and recognize that we have made very little progress on, uh, especially on street uh, uh, facilities since 2009. And uh, I would like to try to see if we can uh, get some sort of schedule, uh, some direction from the council that we could agree on a, uh, uh, a certain rate of, 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 of building t of, of these facilities so that we can say in 20 years we've got most of it installed instead of the, you know, it would take a hundred, couple hundred years to even get anywhere close to the whole plan. So uh, I would like to see uh, a, a building and funding target of 5 to 10 percent a year of the uh, projected costs for those uh, facilities that are, are, are planned. And uh, otherwise, I'm afraid the plant's just going to sit on the shelf. And uh, the other thing in regard to getting extra funding, I would uh, ask the, the uh, uh, council to look for new funding sources for these projects. I, 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 I appreciate the staff's uh, diligent work to, to m get matching grants and things like that, but I asked a question last night, it's quite revealing, that other cities have other mechanisms, mechanisms for funding. Uh, so we need to uh, have some direction from the council, to, some interest in finding new sources of revenue besides just these matching grant things, and uh, so we can accelerate this, these improvements on the uh, uh, bicycle, uh, bicycle facilities on our current streets. So, okay. uh, um, thank you for that. Uh, council, Karen, Teresa, our bicycle experts. Uh, you know, I, I, I hope we get the Some bike plan. Statement. I know that the, I, yeah. I understand it didn't get voted on yesterday, but um, 
I, I'm hoping that we can get some closure and figure out some way that we can look at projects that, you know, you mentioned the low-hanging fruit. What are some of the low-hanging fruit? There's going to be more money coming um, from Measure B. Uh, it's going to be coming out soon. I've t uh, told, um, it was part of my prerogative of chair this year, I said that I want the next Measure B event to be a bicycle pedestrian event or, you know, where they're showing that funding's being released. So I, I will follow up with them on that. So um, I, I hope that we can figure out what we can do in a reasonable fashion. So Teresa's going to bring the checks for us. Yeah. That's what yeah. it sounds like, right, May Teresa? Maybe you could ask I heard this. that. Could you ask the That's staff for VTA? <laughs> could you ask the staff to review what other what other funding mechanisms mm -hmm. other cities are doing? Because uh, obviously, at the last meeting, that was a, that was a revelation last night. So we need to okay. get staff to check into other cities besides the grant, which they're doing a wonderful job on. Right. What other what funding other mechanisms are of... available to cities other than just that? It's allocating general fund money. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. They're, they're, well, that means yeah, it's okay may that be, we've got to take uh, it away from something else. So we got to, and, and and you know, obviously, I mean, I, I I'm very supportive, and the pushback, and it would, we don't even want to say the word prune ridge, but um, <laughs> but part of the issue is, uh, you know, when people look at, I go to some of the meetings, and they're saying, oh, so you've got like two percent mode share, I mean, you guys have heard it too. So that's part of the challenge. Is, you know, we have the thing is like, you know, do we have a chicken and an egg thing here? Will you have people out walking or biking more until they have what they view as safer facilities, but can we, to the rest of the community, justify spending the money on this, those facilities if there's not more people? I, I'm always uh, looking at, uh, which one is it, the egg or the chicken? Uh, the, the, the big issue, it, just take a look at the trail. <laughs> you know, that was a big gamble. We, we right, the put trail a lot is of absolutely packed. That. Staff. And, and the county and the mm -hmm. water district. I mean, look at how successful that is. It took a while, but and, and, finally, and now look at how yeah. it's being used. I mean, right. it's, it's it's amazing. That is no, a it treasure. is. We recognize that yeah, as and, well. And, um, I'm I'm going to have to shut this down. I apologize. Any other council member want to say anything? Thank you so much. Thank you. Sorry, we have to shut early. Group